Okay, welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program a dear personal friend of mine, and I could add with most wholeheartedly, a friend of the world of progressive progress for the improvement of the human condition, and that being Seth Farber, PhD. He's been a pro guest of Conversations for many times, and he's written now a book that's just out, and we want to show it to you. I'm going to hold it up. The title of the book, as you'll be able to see, is The Spiritual Gift of Madness, The Failure of Psychiatry, and the Rise of the Mad Pride Movement. It has a foreword by Kate Millett, but let me hold that up for the viewers and the audience to be able to see the way the book looks in the bookstores. Out now, it's hi highly recommended. And I'll hold this until that time as they can come in close focus on it. But Seth, uh, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to Conversations. Thank you. I'll show, okay, here we are. If you can come in tight on that, uh, let's let them look the way this look, book looks. If you can, there we go. That's the way it will look in the book. So it's a handsome cover. We're happy with the way it looks. Just back up a title bit. And you can see that it has a preface or forward by Kate Millett, the famous, uh, 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 the, the very famous, deservedly so, uh, a critic of, uh, of society. And this is a book that we're going to be discussing, among other things, and Seth, so much. Welcome once again. Let me give you back your copy of it. Thanks. And we have it here that they can come in and from time to time. And welcome to Conversations. Thank you. Yeah. Seth, you are somebody that's in the tradition of... Um, you're a major intellectual in my view. Uh, we're uh, friends and you're really looking at things in a very comprehensive way. You're very concerned for the plight of so many suffering people that have suffered within the uh, psychiatric community. You were uh, a follower, uh, a, 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 a res you respected uh, uh, Thomas Zaz, the mm -hmm. myth of mental illness. You also were in the tradition of R.D. Lang. But I wonder, maybe you could, if I'm, I don't want to, you know, tell, define you, because you have a very idiosyncratic way of your own thinking and everything, but do share just briefly, really briefly, your background, and then let's get into the sub and substance of this book. But you're a dissident psychologist. Yeah. Um, what does that mean, and what are you dissident to, and maybe you could develop it from there. Well, I, I wanted to to psychology in the in the mid seventies. At that time, Freudianism was still the dominant uh, paradigm. Mm -hmm. By the time I I finished my PhD in eighty four, um, the field was shifting, and I uh, th came back to New York, studied family therapy with some of the innovators. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Haley, who, who uh, worked with so-called schizophrenics, Jay mm -hmm. Haley was developed the double bind theory with oh. uh, Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson, yeah. Yeah, and but anyway, he also didn't believe in putting so-called schizophrenics on uh, psychiatric drugs or treating them as if they're incurably mentally ill and as if they c c can't overcome their life crisis. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, I thought I'd go into the field and. Uh, be a re reformer within the field, but that option wasn't open. Uh -huh. So I became then, you know, I guess borrow the term dissident was used frequently about the uh, to, uh, to the uh, intellectuals in in uh, Russia who didn't go along with the re regime. The gulags and yeah. things that went so on. So yeah. I became a, a dissident or an anti-establishment psychologist. I stayed within the field, but I gave up. Uh, the idea that eventually that the field could be changed. Uh -huh. But even before I gave up that idea, I had the good fortune to meet some of the leaders in a movement that was at that time called, this was in 88, mm -hmm. the Mental Patients Liberation Movement. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, <coughs> I was very excited at the possibility of that movement for at that time, yeah. creating change within the uh, mental health system, since I still I thought, well, I could uh, do some good as a therapist and uh, uh, help people. But particularly, I was interested in those people who were labeled schizophrenic and those who were given up on by the majority at that time. Uh -huh. uh, but there was so much change within the field, and uh, 
in the 60s where uh, in the 80s my optimism you know my optimism was somewhat warranted in the 80s the belief in hindsight that looks naive that I could we could change the field uh -huh. because there was a, a thaw in the mental health field as a result of a lot of the countercultural changes in, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Criticisms of the mental health system, the movie by, uh, based on the Ken Kesey book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the interest in Eastern religion and all different kinds of right. therapy. So right. the public was, uh, was becoming, what well, was becoming accessible to the public with different modalities of change. Uh -huh. And we yeah. had the famous Soteria project, which I'll have to talk about some other time. But yeah. It was a place where um, so-called schizophrenics uh, could go. And uh, they did research on this later, but they set it up, uh, Lauren Mosier set it up, an alternative place, uh, and not, not be drugged. Uh -huh. And not and, be drugged. Yes, uh -huh. and, yeah. and be, actually it was based on Lang, R.D. Lang, the psychiatrist who uh, uh, caused a lot of controversy in the uh, 1960s yeah. and afterwards with his radical ideas, but based on his idea that the... Uh, the, the people who are having a, a schizophrenic breakdown uh, needed g to be guided through the experience they were having. And, and some of these people might be our leading um, seers and people of great support, uh, of great importance, but they're being stamped out in the early life by the mal understanding of what important uh, role they might play of some of our seers and our, our avatars to be in terms of seeing things in a larger order than the normal perception. And yeah, that's well, that, part of what forms the basis for they should be, in a certain sense, celebrated in their uniqueness and so forth, rather than uh, vi 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 vilified. Well, that became the, the thesis of this book. And yeah, it yeah. Actually, it was the thesis but of... But that's the beginnings of what led to this book, in a sense, and everything. Yeah, I mean, I, you could say it started with... Uh, Lang was certainly the first of formulated. Not Zaz, not Thomas Zaz. No, Zaz was very hostile to any kind of. He's an atheist. Yeah. He's still alive. He's ninety. Is he really? He must be up in Syracuse. Ninety three. Is he? Ninety two or ninety three. Really? He's is he still up, up in, in Syracuse? Syracuse right, yeah. yeah. He was atheist. Very hostile to the idea that um, that there that that there was. I call it madness. He didn't believe. He thought they they were malingerers, basically. Uh, oh really? At that time, he was. Really? More critical. He's still critical of the psychiatric establishment, yeah. but he, the, he's become increasingly critical of, of people who I believe are most or many of them having, you know, uh, spiritual crises that right. could be the basis for similar to the initiation uh, uh -huh. uh, that, um, for example, that was a, a metaphor I used a lot in the in the 80s, um, mm -hmm. based on Lang's work and uh, Julian Silverman, who wrote an article called Shamanism and Acute Schizophrenia. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. and tried yeah. to show the similarities phenomenologically between uh, the experiences that the initiate, the shaman who was not a, a, a practice shaman, but was going through the initiation. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and so-called schizophrenia, and he found very similar things. So okay. the idea was uh, certainly the idea of a complete disorientation, uh -huh. which was the opportunity to introduce a new framework for viewing reality. Yeah, right, and right, so right. So the, sh the uh, shaman who was frequently uh, someone who was, uh, had, it didn't adjust, wasn't that well adjusted right. uh, to the tribe as he was growing up. Mm -hmm. He, she, it was usually a he though. Uh -huh. And um, he didn't make a successful adjustment because mm -hmm. he interpreted his not fitting in um, as, um, as a call to, as a calling to be a, a, sh a, a shaman. Yeah, that's right. And, and a lot I, of your, some of your artists and some of the people that have more sensitivity and so forth and have a different kind of consciousness than the norm are people who are very, very valuable and are treated very shabbily by the society that is looking for normalcy mm -hmm. or something along those orders. I, I think I've talked to you on other occasions that you used to be up at Cambridge in Massachusetts, your Harvard Square and everything. 
there was in the 70s or the early 70s, there was a movie house. Mm -hmm. And they only showed one movie for months and months and months, all time, every day, three or four times a day, to a packed house that was packed every time, the same movie. They mm. just kept showing it over and over again to this very intellectually oriented, uh, you know, college crowd and that kind of stuff, to a packed house, and that was the King of Hearts. Do you oh, remember yeah. that movie oh, with Alan Bates? I saw it several mm. times. I haven't seen it in about 10 years. What did yeah. you think of so that movie? Oh, that, that was, was one that movie. went along that way. Another yeah. one was... Uh, King of uh, Hearts, in which everyone was killing each other. Yeah, the World normal people are killing, lining up and shooting each other, like took, we do. Well, yeah. It yeah. took place during World War II. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and the, the people came out of the so-called lunatic asylum, and they were beautiful people, and they had a very different way. And the, the whole theme was that the lunatics, so-called lunatics, saying, let's have peace and love and all these good things that are po po maybe now becoming possible in a liberated way rather than in a very constricted way that society is organizing things, uh, might have something to say uh, in, as like avatars or of a, of a new age that might be dawning, hopefully, rather than uh, the adverse side, which mean we, uh, you know, some sort of a great Gadaramadung that is technologically, a, a Gadaramadung oh. uh, that might be available now given the horrible uh, lethality of the weapon systems that exist if we follow the old patterns that are so-called reality, the realpolitik is not. They're yeah. crackpot realists and this is something yeah. that the lunatic people or so-called have a pride that they ought to take in and a lot of the artists and the more sensitive people of the world can relate to that, I would think, don't you? Yeah, I mean, okay. these ideas first came, I don't remember when uh, King of Hearts was made, but uh, Lang, this is from Lang's book that catapulted him to fame, and yeah. this was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I'm, actually, I'm trying to recover some of the ideas that were popular in the 60s, but didn't go, didn't go very, never sunk very deep roots. Uh -huh. You know, it became popular because it was part of the fashion then. It was also, there was a lot of LSD and drug taking. Yeah, and it was all, and, all and, part and of that. Woodstock it was, it, and that sort I don't of mean that the, that the, the counterculture itself uh, wasn't a deep, it was a, a manifestation. It of, was a manifestation of, of major. Profound. Yeah. yeah, it was a major moment in the evolution of consciousness, perhaps right. in universe. Now, I that a that lot of our seers have been uh, heralding uh, over the ages, as a matter of fact. This age might be a time of fulfilling of the seers, of most of our visionary spiritual leaders over the ages, this very time in which you and I sit and talk. Yeah. Which is something to really contemplate. Yeah, it's also a, a time of uh, where, where we, we face uh, uh, dr dreadful po possibility with global, global warming. That's true. It's not, only, it's not so much that the global warming exists because we're at a time now where we could certainly mitigate the worst effects, but nobody, our leaders, refuse to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Republicans obviously D don't acknowledge it exists. They uh, say it's a, mm. and the Democrat. They're all since they're in the hands of the. Uh, I mean, they're in the pockets of the uh, energy industry. Nothing is is done but uh, to. And we do have the Occupy movement. That's worth mentioning, sort of in a passing way. That there are people. Seth, I lived long enough. I'm older now to come to a time when I'm very happy to see that finally this thing emerged. Is trying to birth. The Occupy movement where they're looking at things horizontal, they're looking at things systemically, and they're looking at things in a way for a qualitative transformation rather than a quantitative step up the history's ladder. And that we live in a time, I think that ought to be encouraged and so forth. And your work, it seems to me, would be heralding some of the people who might have been uh, pridefully involved as leaders of that, uh, the Mad Pride movement itself, I think it's a, a, a very uh, good place from which we could, the well from which we could drink are the, the, um, the perceptions and the contributions of people that have been labeled insane or mad. They might actually have, uh, they, te they tended almost all to be on the side of peace, justice, and these kind of things that are ruled out by the so-called uh, crackpot realists that run the yeah. world. Yeah, to go back to okay. the, answering the question you yes, asked please. me, um, in the 60s when it started with the, uh, the equation being made between 
schizophrenia and um, shamans or, or whatever, which was new at the time and yeah. shocking and so on. Here's a quote from Lang. Yeah. said this about the same time as these movies that you referred to were coming out. This is from The Politics of Experience. Mm -hmm. He said, normal men have killed perhaps 100 million, of, this is 1967, mm -hmm. of their fellow normal human men mm -hmm. in the last 50 years. Actually. That would have been more. It, yeah, now it would be more, but it's, it's actually not just normal uh, men because uh, most of the victims of the wars now are civilians. That's so they're right. women and children. I think it shifted fundamentally from the beginning of the 19th century from about 10% were um, yeah. civilians to where 90% of the people who are killed in war-making efforts are now civilians or collateral damage to the uh, soldiers used to be fighting in the meadow, one to the other. I exactly. mean, it's just shifted. It's all collateral damage of civilians, yeah. So normal men have killed perhaps 100 million of their fellow normal human beings in the last 50 years. The condition of alienation, of being asleep, of being unconscious, of being out of one's mind is the condition of normal man. Society mm -hmm. highly values its normal man. It educates children to lose themselves and to become absurd and, of the, and, of, and it thus to be normal. Mm -hmm. And then what Lang th said about the so-called people who are labeled schizophrenics over and over again, but here's one quote, if the human race survives, future men will look back on an enlightened epoch as a veritable age of darkness. The last on us, they will see that what we call schizophrenia was one of the forms in which, often through quite ordinary people, the light began to break in the cracks in our all too closed minds. Lang said, we respect the voyager, the explorer, the spaceman. Why is it we do not respect the mad who are exploring the inner space and time of consciousness? We should learn to accord to so-called schizophrenics who have come back to us from their voyage into inner space, mm -hmm. no less respect than the often no less lost explorers of the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, Lang gave an example. Yeah, yeah, right, Columbus. exactly. Or, or, or our avatars, or our, our leaders, whether it would be a, a Jesus or a Buddha, uh, they've been, uh, uh, our wisdom schools are all predicated upon a view of the world qualitatively different than that of the political class du jour, which is into war, fighting, and the conquering, and that kind of thing, which continues to be the context in which international relations are uh, and society is organized. Yeah. And that there's something new, perhaps, that is required, or now allowed, that may be messianic in the sense of um, coming to a time of qualitative transformation in an evolutionary sense, that may be actually characteristic of the time in which you carried, and I live. Carried one. I'm sorry? I didn't hear the last sentence. Uh, maybe characteristic oh, character of this time. I did a program with Isaac Asimov, a great polymath, right? Yeah. And he said this, we've been here 10,000 generations. We've been here apparently 200,000 years as a species. And he said this is the defining generation, not in a quantitative term, where you move one new tax code or some sort of historical win over somebody else or something, but a time of qualitative transformation comparable to punctuated equilibrium in the, in the evolutionary process where the new system, new species, new the new characteristic uh, emerges. Mm -hmm. If you can understand what I'm saying, yeah. that we might actually have a world if we can make it, or if we don't, if we avoid the pitfalls of uh, the destructiveness of our capability to wipe out the species now, if we get, we may actually get to a real liberated world of universal justice to all human beings and the ecology that has never been characteristic of the context in which uh, evolution of historical events have occurred. This may be a time of fulfilling of the ancient prophecies put forth by all of the major wisdom schools and avatars and, and prophets that, we've got, that have come out of the prophetic tradition itself and all of its guises that have come out of history. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Yeah. Do you think that's maybe perhaps uh, the case? It's very large to con contemplate. But this would be a may, a may of liberation or of qualitative transformation in evolutionary well, we, We've come to the, the fork in the, in the road. Either, right, right. Either, either we're going to... Um, uh, wipe out most of, if not all of humanity. Oh, uh, we're going to liberate it. 
or we're going to take the next stage that's necessary, take the leap into the the next phase of our development. So and that might Sri be... Sri Aurobindo spoke of... Sri Aurobindo is a great sage in the, Syria. Yeah, the Indian uh, philosopher and, and yogi yeah. uh, spoke of the, the new human being, the Superman, the Gnostic right. man. They're using... He was writing in the 40s before it was, you know, politically correct. And right, yeah, so he was an he avatar. Man. He was an avatar. Well, or, many or, people believe he was uh, what the Christians call an avatar, which was one of the, uh, a little different from the Christian uh, view, but it's much similar perhaps to the uh, Muslim view that there are certain messengers. The Hindu view is in times of crisis a, um, a manifestation of, of God, a godly, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, divine creature mm -hmm. uh, c comes down to earth to, to uh, assist in resolving the crisis that we're, we're facing. Right. And certainly the ideas that, uh, and the life that he lived, Sri Aurobindo, uh, that he, and the ideas that he uh, formulated mm -hmm. in 1950, yeah. which was before the West was really you know, and later you had in the 60s all these young people going back and reading Eastern right. wisdom and so on. But mm -hmm. Anyway, he, he was, uh, I guess you could say he, what would now be close to a New Age vision because right. he had the idea that the, there would be the descent of the supermental consciousness onto Earth. Yeah, and supermental that, consciousness. Well, that's what yeah. he called it. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, right. And, yeah. It would, and that would, he believed that that, that transformation mm -hmm. of humanity mm -hmm. um, was necessary in order to um, resolve the, the, the crisis that kept repeating the, uh, the wars, the, um, the uh, kind of mass suicidal behavior that we're, we're, we've been in, engaging in uh, since the birth of humanity. There, not, there have not been really major changes on the, the technological changes, but of course Einstein said this too, on the moral and, and ethical level, you don't right. see a corresponding g growth and development of consciousness. Right, or, right. Aurobindo believed that it was uh, possible, that this had to happen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that this birth of the new man could happen with the uh, Develop the development of the uh, the awareness that what was necessary was a subjective change. Yeah, that's the, right. The, the change in the subjective er era. I know. I know you've written in the past about Constantine and breaking with the prophetic tradition in order to assume power in terms of the establishment of the Christian era and so forth. And broke but in the Judaic tradition. They broke with the prophetic. Uh, Next, you know, the, the coming of the Messiah, Mashiach, and like that. They broke with that prophetic tradition in order to seize power. And that was uh, something that you've written on. And, they, and the people, or the Jesus, or, the, you know, there's going to be a coming of that, or the 12th Imam. Yeah, yeah, you do have a... a, a the people were looking to the future and saying there's going to be an era. It may actually be, where it can be argued, uh, that this may be at hand. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. going back to the the, the excitement the at, the, at the time of, of Jesus, and it did, in fact, see, there was it was a revolutionary movement. He, even though it uh, for the first few centuries it had a major impact, obviously, on the people who called themselves Christians. Yeah. They refused to as you, they refused to pay homage to the emperor, to worship. I mean, the emperor was considered basically God. Yeah, or, or they went back and other things. They had Thor, they had Krakons, they had all kinds of things to deal with the self-reflective consciousness of how everything came into being. So these spiritual traditions were things that were part of the evolution of human consciousness. But now they're to, they've got wisdom schools that we've inherited. People have their identities wrapped up in. But now we're getting into a situation where technologically and so forth, an extension of consciousness is creating a world which is bringing us perhaps to the end of the homo sapien experience. Yeah. Do you understand? Like a birth. A birth canal. We're in the birth canal. We've been gestating. We've been gestating. And we're coming like... We came from Homo habilis. Mm -hmm. That's where we appeared. There was a moment when there was a punctuated equilibrium and the new appeared. We're coming to the end of that and it's opening up upon a point where we could actually have justice. 
Yeah, We've uh, never had justice. There's always been a few ruling over the few. Yeah. And injustice and irrationality and all of these kind of things. Anybody would say we could have justice was called de insane. They it's, were declared insane and put in a lunatic asylum, locked up and then filled with drugs because they're not in keeping with the outdated institutions that have always formed the human condition. Yeah. But we may be coming to a time of, uh, uh, of actual human liberation within a larger order, yeah. ecologically. Yeah, well, it, Maybe. it's true that this birth of the uh, of a new paradigm, a new being, uh, is preceded by the death of, of, of the old. Well, and, and it's subsuming minimally. We have to anchor to history, hmm? or how that's done. We'll have to anchor to history. We're surrounded with... Um, I'm just thinking what you think. I, I'm really impressed with your book. It's beautiful. I've read large patterns of it. And yeah. uh, portions of it, it's really good. And I love Kate Millett's uh, reading and that kind of stuff. But uh, we're, 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 we're in a time of, uh, uh, you, you, you talk also just, let's say, about the Great Awakening in the 19th century of that, that was an event, and then you compare yeah. it to the awakening of the 1960s. Yeah, I will. I, that that's a major moment existentially. Mm -hmm. And there was something blowing in the wind, Bobby Dylan said, and there was something being felt, and that was a moment of qualitative dawning, of qualitative transformative thing, like the water breaking or the quickening in a pregnancy, yeah, or something they, along they, those they, lines. They, it's always a kind of archetypal, it's a death-rebirth type of experience. Uh -huh. And uh, Stan Groff is compared, speaks of, uh, who talks about the, the, the birth trauma. Yeah. The, the the being doesn't know it's being born. It feels right. like it's it's being destroyed. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Which is an interesting idea. It it's, is it indeed, It was something yeah. that uh, Richard Tarnas, who I quoted in the book, who yeah. who uh, was a student of, of, of Grop, but he also wrote this uh, several books on in which it talks about the, the birth of a new paradigm. But all the old paradigms are, are no longer uh, working. Um, and yeah, you, you, you said two things there, if I may. Yeah. The birth of the new paradigm, but the old paradigms. The birth, the, the birth is, is, is not just a paradigm. It's a paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm, because all of our institutions that we've inherited out of history by which we get a sense of identity and the institutions, the architecture, the mental process, the thinking of human nature, everything has been done in one condition that has been qualitatively changed at an existential level. So it's a paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm. It falls across the whole, uh, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole of human society. Yeah. Their institutions are outdated, they're new. It's liberated mm -hmm. as opposed to enslaved. That the historical pattern, uh, James Joyce said, history is a nightmare of injustice from which I'm attempting to awaken. Do you think if we can avoid the Gadaramadong of setting off the weapon systems as we are very likely to do, we can see it coming in the in inappropriate use of our geopolitical power and so forth now, we could do it. But if we can avoid that and actually find the way through to where we have a capability to provide for everyone in a way materialistically and otherwise that we've not done, and the ecology, that we could be coming to a time of liberation at the end of a process that is only seen in terms of qualitative, not just a pa paradigm, a paradigm, a paradigm shifts rather than just one aspect of an overall change that is qualitative, not just quantitative, if you can follow. I yeah, the, the hope is, think? as you said, is, lies in the, uh, in the prospect of another awakening. Well, exactly. Uh, because, the, as you refer to, the, the first, I actually, I actually talk about the second great awakening in American history. These are called by historians the first and the second great awakening. Well, what was, was the a, first? A, was first in the 19th century? Or it was right the century of the American Revolution. Oh, I see. And then the and second I, was I don't the 1820s. talk about it because the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the second is one that's more similar to this 60, yeah. 1960. 1960s, yeah. And that uh, gave birth to the abolitionist movement and uh, you know Thoreau and, and Emerson were part of that Revolution of consciousness. 1860s, you're talking. This is the Second Great Awakening was in, started in, well, they argue over when it was, but let's say about 1820 to 
1850. Most right. of them say it ends right. before then, but right. others made it. Until right. the, the, I would say, it went to the eve of the Civil War, because yeah. there were revivals across America. Yeah, right, everywhere. There, yeah, there, yeah. there was, a, in a sense, they, they had certain advantages that we don't have now. They, they believed in the, strongly, I mean, the average person yeah. uh -huh. believed in the, in the, in the uh, Messianic Age, in right. what was called the Millennium. Right, right. Uh, historian... Uh, was it, it could have been Niebuhr, uh, the theologian. Not uh, Reinhold, but the, his, no, brother. his brother. That was yeah. his brother, right? I didn't. Right. I saw it in the book. He was his brother, Reinhold Niebuhr, famous. Yeah, Niebuhr. H. Yeah. H. Richard Niebuhr. Yeah. Actually, Reinhold was probably more conservative, although he was. A, I think so. Known as a liberal. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. At the end, but uh, the idea. Uh, was oh yes, they were drunk on the millennium. Yes, there was this sense that uh, it's amazing. This was before we had um, the this you know these Christian fundamentalists who exist now. It was a Christian. Was that the era. time of Joseph Smith and the and the, uh, the birth of the Mormons? Yeah, but yeah. that's completely uh, well. We got a president who's phenomenon. a Mormon now. You know, the president who's likely to he's come up. He's not the president yet. No, he's not the president yet, <laughs> as we say. <laughs> but anyway, you know what I mean. But it was out of that moment that Joseph found the golden tablets and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, but they weren't part of the Great Awakening. They, that was not part of a Great Awakening era. It may, I'm not sure when it developed, but it wasn't considered part of the Great Awakening. Oh, okay, sorry. Any, okay, good. Yeah, you're more on... The, I mean, the Great Awakening was really of, associated with these revivalists, the revival movements right. that were taking place across America. Right. It resulted, which was most exciting to me, is they had the established basis of, of a Christian belief system. Mm -hmm. so they all agreed it. Now, one positive aspect of that was they they had this idea that there would be a, a revolutionary change, mm -hmm. they would call it, a mel the millennium would, would be entered yeah, in. Right. And this was millennial not, this thinking, was yeah. post-millennial thinking. Yeah, so right. because they, mm. it was, and we won't go into too many theological, but because yeah. it was post-millennial, they actually thought that if they got rid of slavery, for example, mm. they were convinced, mm -hmm. uh, not only Garrison, but Theodore Weld, mm. who had been a disciple of... Uh, Charles Finney, who was the Billy Graham, yeah. but, a, but a much more liberal mm -hmm. Billy Graham mm -hmm. of the 19th century. But okay. he was the most famous uh, revivalist of the 19th century. Really? Okay. And yeah. he would not let slave owners, and you know, this was, at that time it was a radical move, he would mm -hmm. not let slave owners in his church. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would that would have been radical. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. Had the, about the same time you were having, the, you still had the Fugitive Slave Act or that kind of stuff going on. Yeah. yeah and so people were making money off the slavery and, uh, and, and tied to an outdated institution that had to change and so forth. So yeah. the this whole the slavery itself became a moral, right. moral religious Absolutely. crusade, and in cru Europe too, crusade yeah. against yeah. Uh, the abolitionists. Yeah. They were all Christians, uh -huh. the yeah. leaders of the abolitionist movement, mm -hmm. and the one who's unfortunately he's not studied as much. Well, I have a lot about him in my book. Good, yeah, that's a great the, book. Is Theodore Weld because uh -huh. he merged the the, the uh, spiritual and the political. Now you make a comparison. But he between, did believe yeah. that if we change, uh -huh. we get rid of the injustice of mm -hmm. slavery. Uh -huh. And we will. That will be the ushering in. God will will usher in the the kingdom of heaven on earth. And it was heartfelt and motivated a whole lot of human behavior and everything like that. And then you compare the second one to the '60s. That's Woodstock. Mm -hmm. That's uh, civil rights. That's Martin King. That's Malcolm X. That's uh, you know all of that, which yeah. is a major period, which I agree with. Uh, I think in the fullness yeah. of time, uh, that's likely to be seen as year one. If we live to another few hundred, if we don't blow it all up, if we actually liberate it and we come into a new relationship echoing, I think that uh, time will be figured from about the year 1970, henceforth. So, because there were things going on existentially different in terms of the extended technological capability that we have in the terms of technology. Weapons became species lethal and there was modeling that could show we were transcending material scarcity at that particular time, about the same time. I think that'll be the basis by which, that's what was being felt in the 1968, 69, 70 period, uh, that was being felt around the world and so forth. And uh, we still could refer back to that. That's the most recent stirring, as it were, intellectually of the world, is that period, don't you think, or do you? 
the the established order would like to just forget all about that. That was yeah. just an aberration. Well, of course, Sex, I mean, the, the, drugs the, the, and rock the, and roll. The, the, and that's the attitude the establishment well, the, the, has. The, the conservatives the like Occupy books. The Occupy movement's trying to recapture that. And it's being uh, treated that way by the well, establishment as just a sidebar, kind of little thing, and get back to the normal pattern by which you all get back in your slave roles and fit into the system that's universally unjust, but some are making money and this sort of thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah you have a resemblance yeah. to Lincoln. Do you know that? Have you oh, ever yeah. thought of it? No, <laughs> you really, look, everybody, he has a resemblance <laughs> to our own Abraham Lincoln. Honestly, <laughs> himself. It just realized I'm talking to Abraham Lincoln here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The thesis of my book yes, is sir. that unless the um, this this um, period now of the uh, of course I wrote it before the Occupy Wall Street, but yeah. uh, that gave me hope, and yeah. I, I added some stuff about Occupy Wall Street <coughs> before I went to press. Yes, is that it won't become a great awakening unless the mental patients liberation movement. Was was what the Mad Pride movement was it, known for, right. known as. I mean, I'm saying I'm using that term because I don't, yeah. the people out in the street that are listening probably have not heard of the Mad Pride movement. Well, what and are the uh, have to, What well, have been the manifestations of the Mad Pride the Mad movement? Mad Pride movement, rather than it, locking them up and throwing away the key of the, you know, uh, uh, bedlam and so forth like that. What has been the attitude toward the world society toward the people that have been in this position of being avatar? perhaps or of carriers of mad pride what would be mad pride and celebrated mad pride and the, well, what the, I wanted to, 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 to say was that before I answer was that it is in manifestation of the mental patients liberation movement thank you okay yeah that's what it was called virtually all of the prophets from the old and the people who were that were called that they were called crazy Right, but these were people. That's that's another that's point. The they make I mean, all of book. them. The real, the ones who've really lived down through the ages have been called crazy by the people. Yeah, the political normal, the so-called normal class of their time. Right. Is that not the case? Right. And so that means that might be a good place for us. In to those look. days, they didn't get put up. In, so my point is that these people, that the that the potential prophets mm -hmm. and the have been suppressed if not destroyed by the psychiatric establishment by being put on these drugs and, yeah. and so forth. Okay. And um, how many people have the potential within, uh, within that group uh -huh. of people who are labeled schizophrenic and becoming more and more with the yeah. bipolar label, yeah. how many of them have the potential to be prophets and what is the role of, of prophets and how did the prophets help to transform the consciousness of, of people at the, at, at the times in which they live. And what kind of experiences have they had? Those experiences they had are very valuable. They're not things to be rooted out. They're things to be celebrated. Yeah. Experiences, enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, that is uh, of the essence that we should be listening. A lot of our poets mm -hmm. and our artists and the leading edge of uh, the human condition uh, or the human consciousness should be celebrated and they should be prideful of that rather than allowing the uh, so it the, started the practicality out, of the political class. It started to, out as the mental patients liberation movement in 1970. I think it started out in, in that year 70? 70? 71. Well 71 so it's one year old in terms of the year 70. Yeah, and year I one. think it started in, in Berkeley and then in New York. Okay good the, yeah. Berkeley is uh, uh, Coalition Against Psychiatric Assault. There was the Mental Patients Liberation who was there Alliance that, in New York. Was that who uh, formed it? Yeah, who 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 was there at that uh, you know that time? You had Mario uh, Savio throwing himself on the thing, and you know, uh, no, that was in the Berkeley. that was in the sixties. This what? is seventy one. Seventy one. Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, they, yeah, yeah. It was it was kind of a delayed period. reaction yeah. to yeah. the sixties. It didn't uh -huh. happen until the seventies, and. Mm. Um, 71, mm. but you know, it was still part of that, that era. Mm -hmm. And um, clearly the people who founded the movement were influenced by the writings of Thomas Zaz. Oh, yeah. Because had Tom, Zaz had not come along and said, this is not a uh, mental illness um, at all, but you're victims, you're victims of psychic. No, he didn't say that. He didn't, uh, he didn't, he didn't no. cop to the spiritual. No, he wouldn't no. Not allow that. He was a hardcore atheist, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right, okay, that's interesting, yeah. That's but it, it so some of them had read many of them had read Lang too. But the first way they f defined themselved was victims of psychiatry, and they right. demanded their 
human rights. With great justification, wouldn't you say? Of course. The biomedical uh, giving yes, of they drugs. Yes, they were being locked up. Zine that would knock people out. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, they were yeah. being... Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, um, when I met them, their, their primary, uh, the primary demand of the movement was no forced treatment, no forced confinement. Because mm -hmm. thousands mm -hmm. of them were taken away mm -hmm. for you know, behavior that the family didn't approve of or someone else didn't approve of, and locked up in mental hospitals where they were subjected to very Four unpleasant working. experience. Now, this was this yeah. was in the 70s. It yeah. wasn't in the 50s, so they, right. they, they weren't still, they, they'd already been out. There, right. there was a, more people were out on the street right. than they were in the mental hospital. And, and the overall thing but, they were projecting it was in violation to certain norms that the normal society, for instance, there would be many of them who would not be interested in, let's say, money. Mm -hmm. And if you're not interested in money, there's something wrong with you because all of society is going to bow down to money. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a biggie yeah, that's that the normal is. society does, and that court. And if you're not looking out always to get, you know, that if they're interested in things other than that, or they're having thoughts of liberation or freedom or things like this, these abstract principles, idealistic or whatever, they're just thought of as insane well, because there's only one reason to be here is to do something so you can make a lot of money and get power over people. Well, that's, that's normal. That's what. That's called normal. It, exactly. That's the measure. That's why Leonard Frank, who was in my first book, yeah. ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Right. He had been, I don't know, a, an insurance agent or something. Yeah, he made yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. He, the sixties came along. This was the early sixties. Uh -huh. He moved to San Francisco for some reason, mm -hmm. but not at the time. He was still into making money, but once he got there, he went through all these changes. Mm -hmm. He became a vegetarian. He started reading the prophets. The Old okay. Testament prophets. Uh -huh. He uh -huh. was very influenced by. It ended up with his parents coming out there, and uh, I guess he wasn't making money. He stopped making money. <laughs> yeah, uh, which was you know the that, that, and there was something. That's wrong the measure. With him. If you're not focused on that, that's the measure of your insanity. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be stamped out. Yeah, you've got to keep that money making outer directed attitude toward the society and so forth instead of all these idealistic thoughts about justice and beauty and all these kind of things love and all the rest of it the only thing is do something where you can make a lot of money and that's what called sanity yeah and that's what still reigns does it not mm -hmm. in terms of what motivates the society yeah the yeah, strong over sure. the weak yeah i mean the, real politics these still on, holds on, 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 on that work on wall the, street eric Fromm said the society is insane yeah, that, it is an insane society that they're being asked to adjust to if they've got any sense of real spiritual feeling for the larger and important issues, no? Yeah, yeah. Don't you agree with that? Well, that is the theme. That's what you're thought. about. Yeah, yeah that, good. Good for you. Put it beautifully in the book. But Leonard stopped. Okay, so they put him in a mental hospital. He also became a vegetarian. Uh -huh. They gave him 180 electroshocks. He kept... Good God. Yeah. Trying to get him to be like... The normal. Well, the, this was this was. What is it called? Babbitt. Babbitt. This, yeah. yeah, but this was the thing that they why they, there was the organization of men, uh, mental. Yeah, the organ yeah, yeah. Because once they got labeled, their constitutional rights were taken away from them. Yes. And uh -huh. because you know you yeah, have a, you have a right over your own body. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, so it did result in the passage of some legislation that was somewhat at least for a while. Now it's going backwards. Oh. It did protect them for a while. You mean it protected them in these institutions that well, existed? They, it, a lot of the institutions closed down and they were on the street. And they didn't make any provisions for taking care of existed. people. They weren't always looking out for making money as the one driving force in their life. Understand? I understand. It's economics. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Um, I was just trying to answer your question. Sorry. Um, which was that they were taken to hospitals and they weren't let out of the hospitals. They were subjected to forced treatment. Right. They would eventually get out. They didn't keep them for uh, years and years as they did in the 50s, as okay. you said, there was the deinstitutionalization. Mm. But, you know, when you're, when you're forced to undergo over 100 uh, uh, electroshocks... And all these drugs! ...in your brain... All these yes, drugs the, that would just mess up your mind. The drugs were forced on them. And so there was some progressive legislation uh -huh. passed as a result of lawyers 
who had read Thomas Zaz and also began thinking. Did Zaz and Lang l resonate together or not? Would they no, link? No, they hated each other. They did hate, okay. Well, yeah. Zaz hated uh, Lang. Anyway, okay, Lang yeah. was influenced by, by Zaz. Mm -hmm. But yeah, okay. uh, Zaz did not, well, Zaz was not part of the 60s counterculture. Oh, yeah, he was older. He just, yeah. No, he was that age. Well, was he? Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. He was Hungarian. I mean, he was, I mean, he was older than, than the college students, but he was only 40. So I did was, a program with him up in Syracuse way back when, 40 years ago or 35 years ago, and he said, Mr. China, he had this uh, Hungarian accent, and he had it sitting on the couch, he said, Mr. China, don't you understand the psychiatric community? It's <laughs> nothing but a filthy racket, money-making racket. He said, he was just really feisty and really good. He said, they're all a bunch of charlatans, you know. It was really kind of funny. It was infection, infective, you know, infective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Infective, yeah. He's gotten older now, but in those days he did, was clearly, mm. uh, Clearly indignant at the crimes yeah, right, against right. being committed against the uh, people who were labeled. Wouldn't and Lang have shared that, or other uh, humanist organized people who might not? They might have a difference or something. There would they be. They did. And, and you overall, asked me whether they got along. I yeah. was just answering that. Well, question. I was just. They, they both had a brief against the major thing, which I mean, was the I don't see why they didn't get along. But yeah, I mean, okay, I can yeah. tell you why they didn't, but yeah. I don't see why they. Well, that why could be Zaz why Gauguin, really Gauguin, Gauguin and, uh, and and what's his name? You know, uh, Zaz uh, didn't approve of Lang's, I, as I said, hmm. he didn't like the counterculture, Tom. Okay, okay. He didn't identify with the anti-war movement. Uh -huh, yeah. And he disagreed strongly that society was backwards. That does happen among intellectuals, that they do have a tendency to he wouldn't have, agreed, have little tiffs over different He wouldn't different agree, aspects. agree with you, probably, when you, and me, hmm. when you say that the society is backwards. Completely uh -huh. backwards, uh -huh. it, insane. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He well, thought it was basically He would have disagreed sane. with Eric Fromm? He would have disagreed Yes, with he was a conservative. He was a conservative, okay. A libertarian, but yeah, libertarian. Yeah, liber okay, that, that says a lot. But there are different kinds of libertarians. Yeah, libertarian, yeah, okay. was, yeah so there are, di there are these kind of things that happen among intellectuals or people who think and talk and think and everything on, on details of a thing. But overall, there was a, c a critique of the overall society. Yes, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 many and that still holds and is still appropriate and is now finding expression, perhaps, one hopes, in the Occupy. Yeah. I would hope. Mm -hmm. It's trying to be birthed. Well, what I'd like to see is the, uh, the um, mental patients liberation movement. Right. Today is mad pride. Sometimes it's called the mad movement. I call it mad pride because that was a term that, that's used. That's used by the feminists, wasn't it? Women's pride? And black well, pride. Well, that is in uh, fact uh, the difference yeah. that between the. Uh, that's the similarity between all of these movements: the feminist movement, the gay movement. They went through uh, uh, the uh, black movement. They went through a, a stage in which yeah. the focus shifted from just fighting against the system, or taking a defensive position, to taking an offensive position. Yeah, Perhaps, and, and right? fighting. Uh, yeah, similar probably but fighting against the system and against the injustice. Yeah, rather than defending to, itself. Yeah, go ahead. To emphasizing what made them different. Right. And maybe what made them different were the source of new norms. In, instead of... New norms. Yeah, right. Okay. New values. To be de to determined by themselves. And their new values, new values are better than the values that they're trying to be imposed upon them. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a sign of people to actually taking the bit in their teeth and going with it, and that's what we want to see the people do against the people who are running this world and are, are not, have not got a vision that's needed, and it's going horizontal, it's including everything, economics, politics, uh, mental health, everything like that. It's going out on a, on a horizontal yep. thing, and including systemic, and it may be we're coming to a messianic era that we're living through at these very times. The, the danger now, I believe, in the mad project, moment is that it, it, it loses its orientation. Mm -hmm. now, that's always been the danger, but it came out, became a mad pride movement and had this idea that our deviance may be the source of new norms that could be of Thank value. Thank you. Thank you. Value to the culture as a whole. Yeah, they're ta they tend to talk but about they things dropped like that idea. Why have they dropped it? Well, not everyone's dropped no, it, no. but the two leaders uh, that, that I interviewed uh, 
one of them I, I interviewed for the book. Yeah, yeah. Had, Who's that one that you thought was particularly relevant? Or is there somebody out of the ones you sent me a note and said there's somebody particularly relevant? Paul Levy, probably. Yeah, probably, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Maybe he had very um, ideas of, of awakened from the dream and the messianic. We right. could realize the kingdom of you use heaven that term. on earth. And you've been t talking about the prophetic tradition, too. I remember you wrote a book about Constantine. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. so often, like, ridiculed. Let me give a good definition of it. Okay. It's so often ridiculed messianic into being kind of some flaky sort of thing. Yeah. I try to show it's not. But mm -hmm. Daniel Burston, the professor of phenomenolo phenomenology at Duquesne, mm -hmm. psychology, uh, I think he defined it well in one of his books. I mean, I might revise it a little bit, but we'll use this as a, a breaking off point. Okay, because, good. So yeah. it's just not like uh, the messianic outlook is rooted in the prophetic temper. It maintains that all people are made in God's image. It is passionately concerned with social justice and is actually or incipiently democratic in character, expecting God's will to be implemented in historical time in ways that disclose the truth and that will rally all of humanity to its senses. All right, one, wonderful. So well, the idea of a single messianic like, was just one version of this broader messianic. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think with Sri Rabindu you have a more mature idea well, that's of a messianic. It was he Vedic? He was Vedic. That's Vedic. Or India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was He was Vedic. in that tradition. He was yeah. educated yeah. In, in India. Yeah, right. Because right. you have, you yeah. know, Christians now. And the idea. mother, there was a woman that he related to that was equally venerable at uh, yes, she was, uh, uh, Oroville. His, Oroville. They had a, a Yes, place. she was his spiritual partner. Yeah, they right. Were not right. Uh, partners on the physical Yeah, I know, plane. yeah. Well, not everybody listening knows yeah. that, though. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Mirror Richard. Mm. Mirror. Yeah. Mm. Mm, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so that was there. And then the thing is, it's a little hard. And then what's happening is there's all this capability, and every day, uh, just at the level of secular, or just at the level of things, every day, Seth, there comes over the transom six, seven, eight, nine, ten mad, ma ma uh, incredible transformations that are coming out of the broader world of knowledge and understanding. We've got a telescope that can take the picture of the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago within a nanosecond of its existence about to come up. I mean, we're coming up, a, a, we're coming to the end of a technological, we got a capability of taking care of everybody that we never had out of history. We have a possibility that there's nobody has to go hungry. The idea that the poor will always be with us. We have a capability of liberating the entire human society with an, a technological ecological capability of providing for everyone and an ecological context that resonates with the whole of the uh, the whole of the evolutionary process that has never been characteristic of history until now. At the same time, we have the capability of destroying the evolution of consciousness and universe. What a time to be alive and participant on an oxen's raisin, a razor of going either way. We can go either way. This is a qualitative moment of transformation. And one would hope, as Bucky Fuller would have said, that if we make it, it might be something like a liberating order that might be a resonancy of a liberate. Imagine every human being be able to realize their full potential rather than being so truncated and ostracized and so prejudicial and so ignorant and so forth, that we come to that point, we may be at that point, does it make sense to you that you can see things, just even in secular terms, and in terms of understanding evolution, that we're a point of qualitative transformation evolutionarily in universe. We make it to a point of resonancy that'll inter-accommodate us to universe, well, this is the and we thing. live at that time. This is the thing, I don't I agree with what you said, but. Uh, my response is, I don't think the secular world view is enough to negotiate this severe crisis. Okay. And what this is what I was hoping the Mad Pride movement would do. You're right. And Unfortunately, the, now, mm -hmm. they themselves are going through their own crisis. Yeah, right. Because mm -hmm. the people who really wanted to take it in that way yeah. got scared. Or yeah, they, get, I get mean, scared. they okay. would They would disagree. Or get me. intimidated. They would or say they, they grew, got more mature. Yeah, they got but, real. They got but, practical. Uh, I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. they said. That's yeah. what Sasha Nabral, who's the f one of the, the co founder of, uh, of uh, the greatest, the, you know, the Mad Pride, called the Icarus Project. Uh -huh. People 
should know Icarus, about. Yeah. Uh-huh. They can Google it and go on to their website. Mm-hmm. They have a great uh, uh, forum where they yeah. have di- discussions taking place. But he, he had this, they had this idea of they would um, take a kind of mad sensibility or the kind of sensibility right. that they had mm-hmm. to um, the normal world and that it's, they weren't that specific, but something about madness uh-huh. would enable them to help heal uh, the crisis that the modern world was going through. Good for you. And the fact that your book is called The Spiritual Gift of Madness, I think, is informative. And it's not only, you can't just repair to some absolute secular something or other, but we're going to have to anchor in some way to history. Exactly. But we're not going to have to anchor to the history of Napoleon saying, let's all go to Moscow and die, yeah. or some sort of ego trip or something like that the, of the secular thing. It's going to, we're going to anchor to history of the, of the spiritual traditions by which we can anchor to history, which has always had at its core universal justice for all. And that was always thought of as being hopelessly idealistic and meaningless because it wasn't practical in terms of realizing some have to rule over the others and all that with an age of scarcity is being transcended. Yeah. So it, it, the, the anchoring to the history should be done primarily within the spiritual traditions of the best of the people who thought about informing the entire process rather than just the benefit of some small group that's going to benefit against the mass. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. We've got about a minute left. So I was hoping hoping that the mad pride movement could do that. Well, it still might. It might contribute within the context of the Occupy. Well, that's why I wrote, Good. That's why I wrote my book. That's uh, why everybody to, to should tell, go out and get the book. To find people within the movement who will uh, not... Uh, the movement is capitulated, I say, in the book, to this kind of postmodern secular consciousness, but mm-hmm. very much postmodernism, mm-hmm. which is, you know, defined as a... No, no narratives. We yeah. don't want any narratives of... Uh, Incredulity toward meta narratives. We don't want any narratives of redemption. Mm. I, I, yeah, they, 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 they people I've met have all had visions of messianic redemption. Right, right. I want them to take those visions and take and it include to, it and take it out to that's the what world. We're, that's what not we're, to privatize it. That's what we should be anchoring to. If we're going to anchor to history and we're going to subsume, like in a punct, how where did all where did all the habil uh, what habil I gone? Where where did they go? 99% of the species have gone extinct. Where are the ha- habilis? Yeah, what happened? Okay, what happens to humanity? Well, you're going to have to we anchor it to the best of humanity, which is the spiritual, rather than anchoring it to the gangsters that have run the world primarily in all of human history and is the sad history of what we call mankind from which we should awaken, is what I'm saying. The spiritual tradition should be drawn upon as part of the occupy movement, And yeah. I bet you get a lot of the people within the spiritual movement who would resonate to the Occupy movement and vice versa. No, that's what you I think. was hoping. I'm still hoping. we got to get us off a big awakening. within the Mad Pride movement. Okay, everybody. Let me ta- show everybody take, the book. Who will take that. Give me the concept. book. Let now, me show. I got the idea, <laughs> the gift of madness from Sasha, who originally had it, but dropped it. He's not. He doesn't like it anymore. Okay, everybody go out and get this book. This is Seth Farber. Happy to have been able to bring you these performances. The book... Uh, This uh, program is The Spiritual Gift of Madness, The Failure of Psychiatry, and the Rise of the Mad Pride Movement. Go out and get the book and join the Mad Pride Movement as your fellow conspirators within the Occupy sentiment, which is being brought to you in good, consistent way on Manhattan Neighborhood Network and public access cable television. We got a fight to do. We got a thing to do, a, a, a challenge. And uh, Seth, thanks a lot for contributing so much to that good fight. Okay, thank you, thank you for viewing. We'll be coming back um, again tomorrow. So it's very good to talk to you. And uh, thank you for it. The book is really good. I've read large parts of it. Kate Millett's good, and all that stuff is good. And your perception is really important to inform as part of the larger Occupy movement that's trying to be born at this very time in which we talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you for viewing, and uh, we'll see you uh, next uh, next time on Conversations. Mm -hmm. You do look like Abraham Lincoln. I swear to God, doesn't he, ladies and gentlemen? Go ahead, get a a shot of him. He looks like uh, Honest Abe. He really does. Seth Farber, dissonant psychologist, author of The Spiritual Guide to Madness, The Failure of Psychiatry, and the Mad Pride Movement. And there's your... uh, 
email that people can be in touch with you. And thanks a lot for all the good life, uh, the good work, and for all such a very well led life. Thank you, my friend, for all your contribution. Thank you. Okay, well, that's it. This will be up on YouTube, uh, but the other, okay, so.